Uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you about variational neural learning, and this is uh, the paper we wrote recently. And these are the uh, institutions supporting my, my work. So I guess I'm going to uh, introduce the idea in the context of uh, combinatorial optimization. So many important uh, challenges in science and technology can be cast as uh, optimization problems. And many different areas, such as uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, software engineering, applied math, uh, theoretical computer science, and so on. Um, so some of the most interesting examples or uh, popular examples are, for instance, the traveling salesman problem, where the idea is you have a bunch of cities and you would like to find a path that goes through all of them and goes back to the initial one in the shortest uh, uh, amount of time or distance. Okay, And that's a very complicated problem, but uh, there are many more that are important, like nurse scheduling, vehicle routing, factoring, integers, uh, signal versus background problem, um, chip placement, computer, compiler optimization, and, and many more. Okay, so um, that's what we're interested in, uh, in this context, or at least one part of it. And the idea is that there's a deep connection between uh, material science, uh, statistical mechanics, and combinatorial optimization as beautifully described in this paper by Kirkpatrick, uh, Gelat, and Vecchi. So optimization by simulated annealing is a technique based on uh, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo to solve this uh, combinatorial optimization problems. And uh, they call it simulated annealing because uh, this technique mimics annealing in metallurgy, which people have been doing since forever, where you heat up a crystalline solid you keep it at high temperature for, for a while, and then you slowly cool it down uh, to its lowest energy arrangement, which allows you to have some control over the properties of the material. Okay, And people have been using this to create swords and all sorts of uh, instruments for, for a very long time. Okay, The idea is that uh, you can do something similar, and what they did is they showed the, the Metropolis algorithm, uh, which we use for numerical simulations of many body systems, is a natural tool to, um, to solve optimization problems by simply simulating the system at high temperature, and then slowly decreasing the temperature until you find the ground state configuration of the encoding of the problem. Okay, um, so the origin is is that right? Like so, uh, is this is many of these combinatorial optimization problems can be cast or formulated as finding the ground state of a uh, Nising Hamiltonian of this type. So I call that H target. And uh, it's just basically a Nising model. So sigma i is plus or minus one, and this coupling j i j encode the problem, as well as the fields h i, which uh, couple to the spins uh, sigma i as well. OK. Um, Seems like an easy problem, but it, it, it turns out it encodes a lot of complicated problems, uh, both practical and theoretical. Okay, but already in 1983, this uh, simulated and needing algorithm was used to design computer chips, basically how you place the components in a two-dimensional grid um, and the wiring and so on. But a wide array of uh, problems have, have been mapped to uh, such uh, finding ground states of these Hamiltonians, okay? And there's this beautiful paper by Andrew Lucas, uh, icing formulation of many problems, many MP problems in, in, in this paper. Um, so, um, so simulated annealing mirrors that process in, in metallurgy and in material science. Basically, you explore this optimization problems landscape via a gradual decrease in thermal fluctuations as generated by a, a Monte Carlo algorithm, okay? And then the temperature is slowly reduced until you hopefully find the ground state of the target Hamiltonian, okay? And this exploration that I mentioned here is done through thermal fluctuations. So this is the state space over which you're trying to search. And the thermal fluctuations allow you to jump over those barriers and hopefully find this ground state or spin configuration that minimizes the energy of the Hamiltonian. And um, so that's how you solve the problem through thermal fluctuations. Um, 
So basically what you do is you sample uh, the Boltzmann distribution, e to the minus h target, um, and then you start decreasing the temperature from a very high value down to uh, zero, typically with a linear schedule. Um, and that's how it works. So it has been proven that if you do this process slow enough, similar annealing converges to the solution of the problem rigorously in, in this paper already in 1986. Um, so there are two cartoons so that I want to show you. Is one is a real space, quote unquote real space. So this is the space of configurations. At high temperature, your Monte Carlo simulation explores the entire, roughly the, like with equal probability, the entire space. As you lower the temperature, you start visiting this uh, lower energy configurations. And hopefully by the end of the annealing, you get the ground state. Okay. Um, and there's also another cartoon in the uh, probabilistic, uh, in the probability simplex. To, this probability distributions live in a very high dimensional space. So this is a, just a sketch. But um, just to say three spin configurations, let's say. But uh, at very large temperature, all, the, conf all the, uh, the configurations have the same probability, roughly, so that corresponds to the center of the um, uh, simplex. And as you lower the temperature, you, uh, you move in the simplex, right? Like, and you start targeting the, the Boltzmann distribution with your uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. So if you go infinitely slowly, then you visit all these uh, probability distributions until you hit zero temperature. And here, zero temperature can be the edge of a simplex or one of the corners. Uh, so the, you hit the corners when the ground state is unique, but you hit the edge if uh, two configurations have the same energy in the ground state. Uh, so that's what I'm depicting here. And um, so if you went infinitely slowly, you would just traverse this line. But when you do it in practice, simulated annealing goes out of equilibrium uh, because you have to do it at a finite rate like you have to go uh, and change this temperature uh, relatively quickly. And the Markov chain goes out of equilibrium and visits a family of distributions that are, like they call it quasi-equilibrium distributions, that are close to the Boltzmann distribution, but not exactly the same, okay? And this is the, the language they use in, in, in the proofs of convergence and so on. Um, and, but the problem with this uh, Markov chain going out of equilibrium is that um, this results in potentially poor solutions to challenging optimization problems, all right? So that's the two cartoons about simulated annealing. Now I'm going to introduce quantum annealing, which is uh, another algorithm to uh, solve combinatorial optimization problems. It's based on the idea that um, you can supplement this target Hamiltonian with another Hamiltonian that induces quantum fluctuation. So this is a quantum Hamiltonian. You promote this target Hamiltonian that you were trying to solve to a quantum operator. And, uh, and then through uh, the introduction of this quantum mechanical uh, fluctuations, you hopefully use it uh, so that you can traverse this uh, landscape of uh, solutions faster and uh, hopefully find the solutions in a, um, like using this quantum tunneling effects that allow you to uh, tunnel through these barriers hopefully, and finding better solutions or faster than, um, than simulated annealing. And this is the technology or the inspiration for the technology behind this company, such as uh, D-Wave, which produce these quantum annealers, okay? Um, luckily, however, it's possible to emulate um, quantum annealing using quantum Monte Carlo uh, through a technique called simulated quantum annealing, which is basically path integral Monte Carlo on this Hamiltonian and what you do is you slowly turn down this uh, effect, the quantum tunneling effect. And uh, at the end, you are hopefully solving the target, the combinatorial optimization that you uh, set out to solve. Um, so basically, you use uh, your classical computer, uh, the path integral Monte Carlo, and reduce this uh, slowly. And hopefully, it gets you to a solution as long as these barriers are thin. So this is going to work, as uh, explained in this paper by uh, uh, Santoro and, uh, and collaborators. OK, so that's uh, a well-established technique. It can get stuck and can be effective, but can be so slow if the combinatorial optimization problem is challenging. Um, 
So in spite of the shortcomings, like slow uh, Markov chain dynamics, both SA and the simulated quantum annealing uh, have led to tremendous progress in combinatorial optimization, okay? Um, but I guess the question I'm asking is, or that I'm gonna ask is, can we simulate these techniques uh, variationally? Okay, and that's what I'm gonna talk about. And that's what I call variational neural annealing because I'm, I'm gonna be using neural networks. Okay, so the idea is then for the classical annealing is I'm gonna replace sampling the exact Boltzmann distribution, which is what you target when you're doing simulated annealing with um, approximation of the Boltzmann distribution in terms of a machine learning model, okay? And this model is gonna be chosen such that I can sample it exactly, okay? That there's no autocorrelation effects in the, uh, in the model, okay? So that's very important. And uh, so, again, so now I don't have the exact Boltzmann distribution anymore. I have a model that I depict here in green in this uh, probabilistic simplex. And it's gonna be also targeting the Boltzmann distribution as we anneal, but it's not gonna be exact, okay? Uh, it's gonna be an approximation of the model, but the advantage is gonna be that uh, this model can be sampled e efficiently, provably efficiently, okay? So that's the idea. And uh, does this produce any, uh, anything good? We will see. So that's uh, the classical version. So this is the classical version of the algorithm. So we introduce a probabilistic model, P theta, that will target the Boltzmann distribution, that will try to uh, fit it such that it targets the Boltzmann distribution. And we'll do that through uh, the use of a variational principle uh, where we optimize the model's free energy, which is expectation value over the model of the target Hamiltonian minus the temperature times its entropy. And this is known to be always greater or equal than the true free energy of the system. Okay, that's uh, the variational principle in classical uh, statistics, in, in classical mechanics, uh, sorry, classical statistical mechanics. And, but this is equivalent to basically minimizing the KL divergence between the probability distribution and the exact Boltzmann distribution. So these two equations are, are the same. Um, so this is as the entropy of the model, and so we will need to be able to compute that entropy as well. Um, as in simulated annealing, what we will do is we will also decrease the temperature. So this T will, will make it time dependent, and we'll go from an initial value at high temperature, T0, down to zero, okay? And, and we, hopefully we will be able to get solutions to this combinatorial optimization problem at the end. Uh, so to do this, so we need uh, several ingredients. So we'll estimate this, free, this variation of free energy through samples. And so we need a probabilistic model for which we can sample. Okay, that's the first thing. Uh, but also we need uh, access to, like if we wanted to compute this free energy, we'll need access to P. Okay, the, the probability distribution. So the models that we use have to uh, allow you to compute the probability of a given configuration sigma without expensive computations of, uh, for instance, of the partition function of the model. So the model has to be normalized. Okay, so that's gonna define the choices of the models we have. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll just optimize um, this uh, free energy via gradient descent. And so this is the expression for the gradients of the free energy with respect to the parameters and, and we'll use back propagation and so on to optimize it and so on. But P is gonna be some model. Um, so here's a landscape of uh, probabilistic models. So there's many, many, uh, and those two axes are algorithmic flexibility. So what kind of like quantities you can compute with, the, with your algorithm. And here we have the expressive power. So typically um, mean field-ish uh, algorithms are very tractable but not very expressive. Whereas uh, algorithms which are very expressive, but um, very powerful, they're usually not very tractable. But uh, there's a few in between that are very expressive, but also very tractable. And, um, and here are my models that are not expressive and not, uh, <laughs> not powerful. <laughs> but anyway, so the ones I'm gonna be using um, are the ones that are tractable but also expressive, okay? And in particular, there are RNNs and transformers and um, 
and many more, okay? Uh, but the ones I'm gonna be using today are recurrent neural networks, okay? Because they allow you both uh, uh, samples, which are exact, but also access to uh, normalized probability distribution, okay? And um, so what is a recurrent neural network? It's just um, a recurrent cell which you uh, feed and uh, you, that allows you to basically express the probability distribution over the spin variables as like using the, pro, the, the chain rule of probability, which is basically this expression here. Probability of uh, sigma one times probability of sigma two, condition on sigma one, and so on and so forth. I guess it's not very important, but the key aspect about this model is that it can be exactly sampled um, even if the distribution that it encodes is rough, okay? Which we will target, okay? Yes? So why would, I didn't fully get why recurrent neural networks and why not fully connected neural networks? So fully connected neural networks in general, they, are no, they do not allow you uh, this, effect, this exact sampling. You usually have to use Markov chain Monte Carlo, which we would like to avoid. So let me summarize what, what I've said so far. So, we'll, so in simulator annealing, you have the Boltzmann distribution, and that's exact. That's what we're targeting. But Markov chain Monte Carlo can be slow if the problem is hard. And we're, like, if you want um, a pessimistic view of what we're doing is we're swapping sampling the exact, like wrong sampling the exact distribution with exact sampling the wrong distribution. Because now we don't sample the Boltzmann distribution, we sample a model for the Boltzmann distribution, but one for which you can very efficiently sample. And then the question is, does this produce anything useful? Okay. And I'll show you examples later. Now, a quantum version of the algorithm. So in, I quote unquote quantum, not quantum in the sense of a quantum algorithm, as in quantum computing, but a quantum uh, inspired algorithm that is classical that runs in our, in our laptops. So basically, we extend this idea to quantum annealing. We promote the recurrent neural network to a wave function and use variational Monte Carlo, the, the one that we've been talking about uh, the whole week, and um, basically optimize. Uh, we go from the free energy to uh, the energy of a Hamiltonian that contains the target and uh, some quantum Hamiltonian driving tunneling and so on. And this is the typical choice. There's a sum over the sigma x poly matrices. And we slowly decrease this quantum effects. And hopefully we find solutions to the target Hamiltonian. Um, this also, we can also induce better solutions by adding an, a, what I call an exploration term. It's just an, an entropy. So this is a pseudo entropy is not um, a true entropy is because we're dealing with a pure state that has zero entropy. This is more like a pseudo entropy that, that you can compute in the computational basis that you're using that helps you explore the state, the, the space better, okay? It's just an algorithmic trick. Um, and with this um, algorithm, we can target both classical um, Hamiltonians, but also quantum states, okay? And we'll, I'll show examples of both, um, of both, uh, exam both examples of classical and, cl and quantum states. Um, so, okay. Uh, I just have a question on the pseudo-entropy. Um, so, okay, if it's not like uh, real entropy because of the state. Does it represent any other physical property on the like, or is it just like a mathematical analogy in a way? I, th I think it's more of a mathematical analogy that improves optimization. But uh, there's no physical... I mean, I guess you could estimate this in a physical experiment, like in a quantum computer, for instance, you could take measurements in this computational basis in, in a quantum device or in a quantum experiment, and you could approximate it out of like the statistics that you get out of, um, out of your experiment, but um, it's going to be a very poor estimate and there's no easy way to measure it or, or I'm not even sure it means anything. It just means the entropy of uh, an experiment when you go and measure in that particular basis in a quantum experiment. But um, I don't think it has a lot of um, meaning. 
Okay, and it doesn't represent like some sort of penalization term or something like that. I, I didn't get the, the last bit. Like I was just trying to find an analog, like either in physics and math. So I was wondering if it might represent like a penalization term, like an extra thing. But yeah, so you can think of it of, as a regularization on your search. And, and it is such that uh, what you're doing is you're trying to explore the state space homogeneously because it's an entropy, right? Like, so when you have a like thermal true entropy effects, what you have is a, the entropy, we'd like to explore the whole state space homogeneously. So this is trying to do the same. Okay, thank you. All right, and okay, so finally, we also take advantage of the exact sampling for this. Um, for this. So this is exactly the entropy of density that the wave function represents. Yes, this is the entropy of, uh, of the measurements that you would take in that particular basis. But if you change bases, which is, I mean, quantum states, you can measure them in, in many different bases and so on, then this will change. So it's not intrinsic uh, to the state. It depends on how you measure the experiment, and that's why um, it doesn't correspond to uh, like the true entropy uh, of the state. The true entropy of a pure state is, uh, is, is zero. Yeah. That expression for you select it beforehand. Oh yeah, so I it's, it's so in, so maybe I didn't emphasize this clearly enough, but what we do is we promote this recurrent neural network and we define wave functions based on, on recurrent neural networks. So similar to what uh, Giuseppe and many other uh, in the audience uh, are doing, which is represent wave functions in terms of neural nets. And uh, um, what, uh, what I do in this case is I use a particular form, which is this recurrent neural network. Thanks. So you, you know already that psi theta of sigma is normalized. Yes, exactly. That's why we can compute this term. Because yeah. otherwise you wouldn't be able to, you would need the partition function. And partition functions are notoriously difficult to, to, to evaluate. OK, so this is a cartoon. Like, let me explain the quantum version. So you, you start somewhere at t equals 0, and you optimize the wave function, and you hit a state that is close to the ground state. OK, and that's this process going from green to blue. Then you switch the quantum fluctuations a bit. You decrease them. And your energy, your variation in energy grows because you've changed the Hamiltonian, and then you re-optimize. Okay, you come here, you re-optimize. But then you do this very slowly, and you keep uh, optimizing, uh, changing, optimizing, changing, until you hit this last point, which can be either a ground state of a classical, if you eliminate it completely, the quantum effects, or if you stop somewhere in between, then you hit, you target a quantum state. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, so, so far, so we have introduced two techniques based on uh, modeling the state of a physical system. One is called variational simulated annealing, which mimics the thermal states and finds or can find potentially ground states of uh, classical Hamiltonians. And another one, which is called variational quantum annealing, which can target both ground states of uh, classical Hamiltonian, but also Hamiltonians uh, that are quantum. Okay, um, so let me show you the results finally um, of, of this. So the first thing with this very simple Hamiltonian, one-dimensional classical target Hamiltonian where j uh, i j, j i i plus one is drawn from this distribution, like uh, uniform distribution between zero and one. Um, and then what we do is we target finding the ground state of the system using our techniques. Okay, variational annealing and so on. And we measure the residual energy, so the difference between the average target Hamiltonian at the end of the annealing versus the true ground state, which we can compute for the system. It's very simple. And we do that as a function of how long you spend doing the whole annealing. So you expect that uh, the, the longer you wait, the better, which is what we see. Uh, so in here you see, uh, both the 
quantum version or quantum inspired version and the classical inspired version. So they both produce ultimately solutions that are very good when you wait long enough. But um, the quantum, so the classical version of the algorithm is better than the quantum inspired version. And um, because it decays faster in the asymptotic long time limit. Okay. Um, so that was uh, good. We did some fits to like the time scaling and we did finite size scaling and we saw that this finite uh, time scaling was roughly almost uh, system size independent. And it's basically the energy or the residual energy decays as a power law with different powers um, as you increase the time. Okay. But then we wanted to compare with uh, different techniques. So with simulated annealing, this can be worked out analytically. And uh, for simulated annealing, uh, it goes logarithmically. So inverse of the log of time, meaning that uh, our techniques go faster than simulated annealing, mm -hmm. at least in, in our numerical experiments. Um, it goes faster than real quantum annealing. So real quantum annealing means solving the Schrodinger equation as a function of time, like real-time dynamics, which is surprisingly also logarithmic and very slow. It's just a little bit faster than, um, than simulated annealing. Uh, the other one is solving the Schrodinger equation in imaginary time, where you change uh, time by i times time, and it goes as a power law which is the closest uh, to our results, which uh, go as a 1 over tau to 1.5, roughly 1.9. So this suggests that there's a speed up with respect to real quantum annealing and with respect to simulate, and the, the simulation is close to uh, simulated annealing, uh, sorry, to uh, quantum dynamics and imaginary time. And we think this is because um, these algorithms are kind of like an approximate version of uh, imaginary time dynamics. Like when you do gradient descent on this um, objective functions, this is like an approximate um, imaginary time dynamics. And that's how we more or less argue, although we don't have a proof that this is the case, but... Uh, mm -hmm. The question in the second line, these numbers, I guess they correspond to the spectral gap. Also. One of them corresponds to the spectral gap. I, I think so, yeah, but I don't remember the details. Yeah. I wonder what, why they are two. Yeah, I don't Gamma know. must be some time scale coming from yeah. Right, right. But I don't, I don't remember the details. But I'll, I'll be able to tell you later. Uh, when I, I, can go, I can go back and see what like, the question. argument is. Yes? I think I'm just a little confused about what you mean by exact by so you can sample exactly that uh, p theta, that distribution, but this distribution is a model you wrote, like it's a recurrent neural network, so it doesn't represent the Boltzmann distribution, so you, you have to optimize it. You have to do gradient. So, after, after I optimize it, I don't, do I still have to? So sure. after you optimize it, you just sample the distribution and it oh, okay. gets you... Uh, solutions to the okay. problem. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm I also have a question. Yeah. When you do the quantum annealing, what exactly do you choose for, maybe I missed it, uh, you choose the driver Hamiltonian? The driver Hamiltonian is the usual one, the, the one that people use in, in true quantum annealing, which is uh, sum over i of sigma i x. So would you get better results if you had a different? It's not clear that uh, that's the case. Even like people who do real quantum annealing, like who build construct quantum annealers, they don't know if changing this driver Hamiltonian for other like more non-local ones and so on is beneficial. Um, it's also the simplest one you can implement. So it's a I think open as to whether there are better ones. Of course, if you have a specific problem, then you might be able to design. A, tar a better driver Hamiltonian, but um, not in general. Okay, then we went ahead and wanted to try a little bit of a more complicated model. This is called Edwards Anderson Hamiltonian. And it's basically a two dimensional Hamiltonian where 
Jij is drawn from uh, the uniform distribution between minus one and one. Okay, and we tested uh, different algorithms. So we tested uh, no annealing, basically optimizing the objective function without doing this slow process. Our classical version, our quantum version, and the one with uh, the entropy exploration term. Um, okay, so we tried all those, and these are the results. So uh, this is comparing our techniques among themselves. And what we find is that uh, this classical version is, again, the best in the long time limit. Okay? When you wait long enough, this classical version always wins. Okay? And here are the different quantum ones. And uh, yeah, the best is the classical one, which is, I think, we believe is due to this entropic effect that uh, we... That, that, that come from like trying to simulate the temperature, okay? Uh, through the free energy uh, optimization that we do. So it produces solutions that are significantly accurate, like orders of magnitude better than, say, trying to go and op optimize, optimize the objective function without doing annealing, okay? So the true comparison, which I found the most interesting, is um, comparing our best technique with, um, like traditional simulated annealing based on Markov chains and simulated quantum annealing as implemented in this paper. And what we found is that um, this technique, simulated annealing, simulated quantum annealing, well, first of all, simulated quantum annealing is better than simulated annealing as um, argued in this in the science paper in, uh, a long time ago. Uh, it, they're better also than our technique when you have little time for your optimization but eventually, if you spend enough time doing the annealing, this technique is orders of magnitude better than, than traditional simulated annealing and simulated quantum annealing, which we found a little bit surprising. But that, that's, that's the result. So, and it, we think it's due to the, okay, the entropic effects, but also the exact sampling. Because sampling, when you have a spin glass, even this other sample from all, can be very slow. Okay. And by combining this with this exact sampling allows us to beat the traditional techniques. Okay, so that's great, but this is a very simple Hamiltonian. It can be solved by other techniques. So we wanted something more. And we went for fully connected spin glasses. So one of them, the most, one of the most famous is the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. It provides a conceptual framework for, for many things like disorder, frustration in materials, but also in machine learning, people use it to analyze landscapes and so on. And so that was the first one that was much harder. It's fully connected. All the spins interact to each other. JIJ is a sample from a Gaussian distribution. Um, and so we wanted to tackle this harder problem. Uh, but also this one. This one is fun. It's called Wisher Planted Ensemble. It's also a fully connected model um, where you know what the solution is. It's just that you bury the solution like near, like with uh, states that are uh, random, but nearby in energy. So you can construct this uh, Hamiltonians. And uh, I have this um, needle in the haystack cartoon because we know what the solution is. It's just this. It's uh, all spins up or all spins down. But then very, very close uh, uh, states in energy have like completely random paramagnetic. And so that it makes it for an interesting problem. It's very hard to solve but you know what the solution is and its energy, okay? So uh, and the definition of the model is this, but uh, it doesn't matter. Um, so what we found again is if you don't have a lot of time to uh, spend, then simulator annealing and simulator quantum annealing are better. But if you have enough budget, then it's better to use this technique even where it's fully connected spin glasses, which are very hard to uh, sample with Markov chains. Um, in some cases, so this is for the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. In, um, so this is for the other Wisher planted ensemble. We can be orders of magnitude better again in the long time um, um, annealing limit. So this, the other thing that is very cool about this model is this tunability. You can tune the hardness of like finding the problem. Basically, how, how far is this state from the nearby states? And if you tune it so that they're all very piled up, 
then you can break our technique as well. So at some point, I mean, we still get a little bit of a better gain, but uh, uh, a hard problem will break as you would expect um, our technique as well. So I mean, we still find like low energy solutions. So these are histograms as a function of energy and the density of solutions. And uh, yes, we can, we can make it break. All right, so uh, final. So these are my last uh, classical example. Let me show you two examples targeting quantum states. Uh, so targeting quantum states. So the first one is, so variational annealing targeting the ground state of the Heisenberg model on the triangular lattice. So the Heisenberg model is, is this Hamiltonian. It is a frustrated system. It has a sign problem. It's, it's difficult uh, to solve. Uh, the ground state has been studied a lot, and the consensus is that uh, it has magnetic order um, with this pattern in, in its ground state. Okay? And what we do is we basically target the ground state using variational Monte Carlo, but we supplement um, the objective function, which is the energy, with the pseudo-classical entropy, the pseudo-entropy that I introduced, and some like fake temperature, and we basically anneal the temperature down to zero and target the ground state in the end. Um, so these are the results. So this is comparing with exact diagonalization on a four by four lattice. So it's a tiny system for which we can run uh, exact diagonalization. And uh, what we found is that, uh, again, when we do simulate it, like this annealing process, we get solutions that are more accurate, okay, than uh, if we don't do it. Okay, um, but then the real comparison, so we did this comparison with just with DMRG. So and what we found is that we, like this annealed recurrent neural networks, um, eventually if you make the system big enough, become better than, than the DMRG solutions. Um, on the, on the uh, for smaller systems, I mean, if you make a system small enough, DMRG eventually becomes exact. So it's very difficult to beat, but um, for large systems, we, we show that uh, we're a little bit better than, than DMRG. So that's the first example. The second example is, it's, it's this Hamiltonian. Um, it's a bosonic Hamiltonian with an interaction term that looks like this on the Kagome lattice. It's basically a sum over the, uh, n the bosonic number, the, how many bosons are in each of these um, hexagons that you see. And this has a very interesting phase diagram. It has a superfluid phase for a small v, but also a so-called topological spin liquid in the large v regime. And this, this phase is very interesting, uh, but on top of that, there's no sign problem for this Hamiltonian. So you could, in principle, use quantum Monte Carlo based on uh, path integrals or stochastic series expansion to study it, okay? And this has been done. It has been done in, in, in this paper in 2011 where they show that, uh, or basically roughly show that the, the phase, like the Hamiltonian harbors this topological spin liquid. Um, so these phases are very interesting. They defy the Landau paradigm of classifying phases by symmetry. So the states are symmetric. They have no order parameter. And, um, uh, but nevertheless, they are distinguished by more subtle topological properties. Um, and, they, and that's why they call they're called topologically ordered phases because when you go and distinguish them using topological quantities, you can see that they're different, for instance, from a, like a paramagnet, like a high temperature state or a, a, this just simply a, a collective paramagnet. Um, and this topological order can be detected by means of a measure known as a topological entanglement. And uh, so that's what they've done in, in that paper. They, they, uh, they studied the topological entanglement of, of that Hamiltonian. Um, so what is this uh, topological entanglement entropy? So it, you, you have the system, you, you divide it into A and B. So there's two parts, two spatial uh, different parts. And, and um, the size of the boundary between region A and B is L. And uh, this, then they, they compute this so-called Renyi entropy or Renyi entanglement entropy of that particular bipartition between A and B. And it's basically this quantity, you take the trace of uh, rho A to the power of N, where rho A is the reduced density matrix of the subsystem A. 
So basically, you take the system, it has A and B, you trace over B, construct the density matrix of uh, A, take the trace and, and the log, and that gives you a measure of, uh, of uh, the entropy of that uh, subsystem A. And um, for a topological phase, it has been shown using many different techniques, basically mostly field theory techniques, that um, the entanglement entropy is proportional to the boundary of uh, the bipartition between A and B, and that's, that's L, but it has this gamma term that reduces the entropy of the, of the state plus some uh, corrections. And so this gamma distinguishes between a topological phase and a non-topological phase, but it's difficult to access because um, you can try and measure this, but this will be kind of like blurred or overwhelmed by this term which depends on the entire boundary between A and B. But people came up with techniques to, uh, to extract gamma. And so that's what they explore in, this, uh, in that paper, in that nature physics paper. And, and these are the results. So, they, so the idea is for a topological phase with a Z2 gauge symmetry, you have that gamma should be locked to. This is predicted by field theory and by uh, like topological field theory and, um, and by particular examples of models where they can solve this problem. This is for, for all n, or is it for n going to infinity? This is for... Um, this n and there any entropies? Any n. Any n. In particular for entropy also, right? If you think yes, that. exactly. Um, and so they computed this quantity, and what they found is so they, they're plotting two gamma. So they should reach two uh, log two if they found the phase. What they found is there's a function of uh, inverse temperature. So low, the ground state lower temperature would be high beta. Is that um, it saturates at half of the what they expect, and this can be argued. Uh, like this has been seen in, in other models, in exactly solvable models, and so they argue, they conclude this should be that phase, but, but quantum Monte Carlo cannot reach temperatures low enough so that this quantity saturates to uh, log two. Okay, and then the same is true, like they did it for different system sizes and so on. But they, like they always saturate at log two. Sorry, one half of log two because they plot two gamma. <laughs> and, and so, okay, so we said, okay, let's, See if uh, this annealing technique targeting those states can recover this log two. That's what we that's what we try. And so this is our computation. So this is as a function of v. And what we found is that um, um, as we make v v larger, we get log two. Okay, for the for this uh, topological entanglement entropy. So um, we were happy and. The answer is again the RNN, and uh, we use this annealing and so on, and turns out we can get uh, to more precise values. And we think this is due to the fact that um, sampling in this large V regime is very difficult for quantum Monte Carlo, but since we get rid of the sampling issue, we are able to converge this quantity better. Okay, so that was my second example. Um, so this is. I'm almost done. Mm -hmm. So I guess, yeah, so our variational calculation saturates to the values predicted by field theory for this specific uh, quantum state. And the other thing I'd like to highlight is, so while this problem is suitable to study with our quantum Monte Carlo, we're still able to convert this topological properties better than very low temperature quantum Monte Carlo, which was uh, surprising, or it is surprising to me. So let me conclude. So we've uh, introduced uh, variational neural annealing that produces very accurate solutions to a spin glass problem and many body uh, ground states. So applied to quantum problems, uh, we were able to converge to very accurate ground states um, and quantum systems, even if these problems are suitable for quantum Monte Carlo, okay, or even simulate annealing in the classical ground states. And what I think is there's still room for improvement, right? Like um, um, even for problems where there's no sign uh, issues, okay? Uh, or where like sampling becomes difficult as you lower the temperature of the simulation and so on. Um, 
so classical annealing produces the best results. Uh, so this suggests that um, perhaps targeting variational quantum annealing at finite temperature may be the best thing to do. We have not done that yet. So really targeting a quantum state at finite temperature, then annealing that state may be the best like, combination of the two. With the hope that you'll be, you'll be using a mixture of uh, thermal and quantum effects. So we will see. So we have some theoretical understanding. We have a sketch of a proof for the convergence of the variational quantum algorithm that we introduced. Um, we have some steps that we're still polishing, but we'll see how <laughs> that turns out. Uh, but not for the classical one, which is the, the one that works best. Um, I guess the main message I, at this point is just swapping, like targeting the Boltzmann distribution, that's what we want and so on, but uh, swapping it with um, a, an approximate model, but the one, one you can sample may bring uh, higher quality solutions and higher quality ground states and so on, and this is, can be applicable in many fields. And, and that's it, thank you so much. <laughs>